Hi there, I'm Jason Tamerick. One of the attributes of light is the color of light, but the color of light is also influenced by how the camera sees it. In this lesson, we're going to explore the color of light and how you can use white balance to achieve the desired look in your shot. Before we can start talking about color temperatures, it's important for us to define what is white. So I got a question for you. Is this white? How about this? Is this white? How about this? Actually, this is green. This is orange. This is blue. So what are we talking about here? Well, white reflects all wavelengths of light. And unless the light is full spectral, the white card will be tinted. So when I was standing in the studio, I was standing under tungsten lights, which have a warmer orange hue. And since that was the only light, my white card was reflecting that and it appeared orange. Now, when I was standing outside, sunlight has a blue hue, which tints everything blue. And in the last example, I was standing under fluorescent lights, which produces a green hued light. So when I asked you, what is white? The answer is relative because it's based on the color of the light that was illuminating the white card. So how is it that this appears as white? Well, in real life, our brains adapt to the hue of the ambient light that we're in, and after a while, we forget about it. Now, this is pretty cool that our eye is able to adjust and our brains are able to adjust to the color of the light that we're in. But the problem that we face in cinematography is that cameras can't. You see, the imaging sensor in a camera works a lot like our eyes in that they capture the light of the scene, but unlike the eye, we have to tell the camera what color we want it to see as white. Otherwise, the camera will always heavily tint everything. But before we can talk about that, let's take a deeper look into the color of light. In order for us to work with the color of light, we need a way of accurately measuring it so we can consistently reproduce the same color again and again. Now, up to this point, you've probably talked about color in relative terms. If I were to ask you to think of something blue, I guarantee that every one of us is imagining a different shade of blue. Maybe you're thinking of something that's navy blue or sky blue or cerulean blue. I mean, there are literally a million shades of blue within blue. But on a movie set, we have to quantify the color of light in much the same way we quantify heat temperature. You see, what's warm to me in Los Angeles may be something very different than what's warm to somebody in Alaska. So instead of using a relative term like warm or cold, we use a temperature scale measured in degrees to quantify heat temperature. 20 degrees Celsius, or 72 degrees Fahrenheit, is a measurable, quantifiable way of discussing heat. Well, the same applies when we talk about color, and we measure it using a scale called color temperature. Color temperature is a range from red to blue, and it's measured using a scale called the Kelvin scale. So for example, tungsten light falls at around 3200 Kelvin, Fluorescent light falls at 5,000 Kelvin, and sunlight on a bright summer day at noon with no cloud cover is 5,600 Kelvin. Well, what is Kelvin? In order to understand the Kelvin scale, we need to understand where it came from. So, if we go back to measuring heat temperature, one of the scales we use is the Celsius scale, and it is based on the freezing and boiling points of water. So, the temperature at which water freezes has been designated as zero degrees Celsius, the temperature at which water boils has been designated as 100 degrees Celsius. So these two benchmarks is what defines the Celsius scale. But temperatures, of course, can get a lot hotter than 100 degrees and a lot colder than zero degrees. So cold, in fact, that at minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, all atomic activity freezes. It is the coldest possible temperature in the universe, and nothing can be colder. And that's why scientists call that temperature absolute zero. See, back in the early 1900s, a British scientist named Lord Calvin created a brand new scale to measure heat temperature, and it starts at absolute zero. So while absolute zero is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, in the new scale, it's zero Kelvin and the temperatures just go up from there. So what does measuring heat temperature have to do with measuring color? 
Well, Lord Calvin speculated that if you take what's called a black body radiator, and that's a solid object that doesn't absorb or reflect any light, and you start to heat it up, it's going to start to glow. But that glow is going to produce different colors of light based on just how hot its temperature is. So black bodies at temperatures below about 4,000 Kelvin radiate a reddish light, and temperatures above 7,500 Kelvin radiate a bluish light. But we use this black body radiator as a point of reference for other light sources. So based on the Kelvin scale, if you were to heat this black body up to say 3200 Kelvin, you're going to get the same color glow that tungsten generates. Or if you heat it up to say 5000 Kelvin, you're going to get the same color that fluorescent light emanates. Heat it up to 5600 Kelvin, and you get the same color as sunlight on a bright sunny day. This scale is called color temperature, and it's used in astronomy to classify stars, in photography to quantify how film emulsion reacts to light, and in digital cinematography to determine how the imaging sensor of a camera perceives different colors of light. We also use it to identify the color of a light source, and how we then mix and match those different colors to achieve the desired look on screen. Earlier I talked about the color temperature of sunlight, fluorescent light, and tungsten light. But where do other common light sources fall on the color temperature scale? Well, on the red end of the spectrum, we have really warm light sources, like a match flame or a candle flame. And these are typically between 1700 and 1900 Kelvin. Well, sunrise and sunset both fall at around 2000 Kelvin. Roughly half an hour after sunset is about 2500 Kelvin. Tungsten light, which has an orange hue, is 3200 Kelvin. Sunlight around early morning and late afternoon falls at about 4,400 to 4,500 Kelvin. Fluorescent light is measuring at 5,000 Kelvin. HMIs, which mimic the color temperature of sunlight, are at about 5,400 Kelvin. Now, the average color temperature of the sky at high noon is about 5,600 Kelvin. An overcast day, which is a little bluer, is about 5,800 Kelvin. On summer days, with direct sunlight in the shade, or if it's partly cloudy, you'll notice that the color temperature becomes a lot bluer, and that falls between 8,000 and 9,000 Kelvin. And on a summer day with blue skies, the color temperature becomes very blue, anywhere between 12,000 and 28,000 Kelvin. So as cinematographers, color temperature is an important tool to create and match light sources of different colors, to simulate different times of day, and to configure the camera to produce the cleanest image under a variety of lighting conditions. All right, everyone, that's all we have time for today. If you want to see the rest of this video tutorial, if you want to read the exclusive companion guide and download projects that you can use to practice these techniques at home, be sure to check out the full course at filmskills.com. In the all-new Film Skills Camera and Lens Master Course, I've partnered with Hollywood directors and cinematographers to teach you the tools and techniques to achieve a more cinematic look that attracts higher-paying clients. In the first section, you'll learn the roles and responsibilities of the camera crew on set. I'll take you onto Hollywood sets where you'll learn directly from the camera crews behind some of the biggest TV shows and movies on screen. Then I'll methodically teach you how to configure, prep, and build your camera package. Learn how to test and maintain your lenses, how to choose the right camera accessories for the demands of each shoot, and how to avoid costly mistakes in the field. Next, I'll take you deep inside each camera function and teach you how to push your camera's capabilities to the limits to achieve a professional, emotionally compelling cinematic look for each and every shot. You'll learn how to find the sweet spot of your camera's imaging sensor, how to set the perfect ISO, choose and expose the right frame rate, how to set focus using pro techniques no matter how your subject is moving or how shallow your depth of field. Learn how to set proper exposure with your f-stops and t-stops. How to use neutral density filters and polarizers. How to utilize the focal length to control compression and the depth in your shot. How to master your depth of field. How to create action shots with your camera shutter. And how to properly manage media for a seamless transition into the editing room. Then in the next section, learn advanced composition techniques lifted directly from Hollywood sets. From framing for multiple aspect ratios and determining eye lines, to determining camera placement in complex setups. You'll learn standard shot types and common variations, secrets to professional composition, and how to frame people, how to determine eye lines and create depth no matter what camera you're using. 
So whether you're just a beginner or an experienced professional looking to improve your techniques, the Film Skills Camera and Lens Master Course takes you deep inside the filmmaking process, revealing techniques used by professionals on top TV shows and movies. The knowledge and experience in this course is one reason why over 125 top colleges and universities use film skills in their classrooms. And finally, when you complete the course, you'll receive a personalized certificate of completion and you'll be listed in our professional certification database. So if you're ready to unlock the true potential of your camera and lens, increase the value of your work and attract higher paying clients, then join the Film Skills Camera and Lens Master Course today.